about veterinary medicine. We've had eight teams solve some really able to try to pull, so see some very interesting things as What I'd like to do now is to allow Jeremy Kennedy to come and talk for just a second and talk about an opportunity that each one of you as a team has in April with the College of Veterinary Medicine. Jeremy. Thank you, Rodney. Uh, thank you all again for being here this weekend and congratulations on all the hard work and lack of sleep that you've put in. We're very excited to see what y'all have been able to come up with. Uh, what I wanted to talk to y'all about is an additional thing that comes with this Aggies event in particular is the opportunity to present at a conference we host in April called the Veterinary Innovation Summit. Uh, so this year will be April 3, 4, and 5. It's Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And each one of our student teams here will be invited to do a brief, probably about five minute presentation as part of the conference in front of all of our conference attendees. Our conference is attended by um, Many people throughout the veterinary industry that want to be innovative and want to look at the future of veterinary medicine and animal health. We have sponsors from all of the major pharmaceutical vet companies and providers, including Beringer Ingelheim, um, and they send their head of US operations and chief medical officers to our event to come and see what's new and happening in the vet industry, and student innovations are certainly part of that. So I'll be coordinating with each team following you know, the conclusion of the events today, but I'll just, Put it on your calendars. Every team will be invited to be uh, a presenting team as part of the Innovation Summit coming up in April. And I'll be hanging around after the event if any of y'all have any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. <laughs> we are live streaming this event. We've had as many as a hundred, couple of hundred visitors and viewers uh, during the last live stream. So don't forget, we'll be live streaming it. If you are interested in continuing to follow, subscribe to our channel and then also uh, subscribe to our, our podcast. Without further ado, Beringer Ingelheim is the one who has uh, sponsored the event and I want to have one of our judges and our judges introduce themselves so that you know who they are. And Dr. Karen, if you wouldn't mind, please, and use the microphone, please. Thank you. No, you don't have to stand up, we got you. Hi, where, do, where am I looking? Right there. Hi, I'm Karen Lass with Beringer Ingelheim. Um, I help with the North Texas area of our um, Company and my counterpart is. I'm Dr. Gail Millard, and I am Dr. Lass's counterpart in San Antonio, and I cover South Texas. It is such an honor and a privilege to be a part of this event. I'm Eleanor Green, and I'm the dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences, and this is one of the most fun things I get to do every year. So, thanks for making my life terrific. Um, I'm Beth Scallon. I am a faculty member and director of the Clinical Skills Lab at the College of Veterinary Medicine. My name is Mary Bailey. I am a graduate of the College of Engineering and most recently a retired staff member here at Texas A&M. Hello, <clears throat> I'm Bill Schwab. I'm a graduate of Industrial Engineering from here and uh, I'm retired here in town. Just love to uh, participate in Aggies event professional volunteer. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, judges. Thank you so much for your time. All right. Without further ado, let's introduce the first team, Safe Snooze. Please come forward, and we'll get your prototype up and ready to go. All right, howdy y'all. We, we are Team Safe Snooze, and we have designed a canine anesthesia recovery solution. So my name is Thomas Solis, and these are my team members, Kimberly, Aaron, Jacob, Barsha, Reed, and Prudence. I'll take it, he's not a great friend. Come away from him, he's having a go at you. Aggressive dogs are scary. And it doesn't help that there's nothing on the market made specifically for full body canine restraint. 
what about aggressive dogs waking up from anesthesia after surgery? These dogs have the potential to hurt themselves and their caretakers. We have created a solution for the anesthetic recovery of aggressive dogs. Did you know that most veterinary staff injuries occur during animal restraint? With Safe Snooze, you'll be able to keep the dog from hurting themselves while allowing your care staff to safely monitor and care for the recovering patient. Made with a removable, machine washable cover, waterproof materials, and a durable Kevlar fabric, the Safe Snooze is easily cleaned, reusable, and long lasting. The Safe Snooze is easily secured while the dog is anesthetized and effectively restrains the dog's head and limbs during recovery. that doesn't give you side eye. He doesn't give you a warning growl. He just lunges at you. So you cannot wait to get him under anesthesia in his sleep. So he's not trying to bite your face off. The surgery goes well. You take your post-operative x-rays and you turn off the anesthetic gas. Suddenly, all hell breaks loose. Chomps has launched himself off the... You have launched yourself at Chomps in an effort to break his fall. And then he takes a big bite out of your arm before your coworker notices the commotion and then rushes in with a blanket to wrestle Chomps into submission. You're bleeding, Chomps is bleeding, and your coworker is having an anxiety attack. Wouldn't it be great if we could prevent this from happening? Any dog has the potential to bite and thrash around waking up from anesthesia but especially when dealing with known aggressive patients, why take the we'll deal with it if it happens approach if you can anticipate and have a system that's ready to prevent this from happening in the first place. Situations occur like this every day. In a 2014 study out of 777 severe attacks reported, 54% of those occurred during animal restraint. Another 9% occurred while technicians were trying to lift animals. Uh, a study done by the American Veterinary Medical Association shows that 70 to 80% of worker compensation claims filed by veterinarians and veterinary technicians are from animal attacks. Stress and fear from waking up from anesthesia elevates these attacks. Based on this data, it has shown that we need to create a product that alleviates the aggression from the dogs, which will therefore decrease the attacks that veterinarians and veterinary technicians face. Currently, there aren't any innovative approaches to like safely restrain a dog when it's recovering from surgery. Usually, technicians place a towel over a dog to restrain it. However, this approach is risky because sometimes a towel may not cover a dog sufficiently, or it might fall off, and the dog might bite the technician. So our team came up with different alternative designs of how to restrain a dog when it's recovering from anesthesia. One design was something resembling a stretcher. Um, we could have a board with straps in which we could restrain the dog. Another design was something resembling a dog bed, which is like a cushion with raised edges. And then we were thinking of some innovative cushions to restrain the neck and head of the dog from moving. These ideas all came together and ultimately resulted in our final product. So no matter what the design, we need a few key features. A perfect device would have these five requirements in order to be safe and effective in the animal workplace. And we came up with the solution, Safe Snooze. Safe Snooze, with its one-of-a-kind design, can be used effectively and efficiently in the workplace and it offers a new solution to the vet med world as well as meeting every single one of those requirements. 
So the safe snooze is designed to restrict the movement of the head, not only to prevent the patient from harming themselves, but also inhibit them from biting their caretakers. So we use the neck cradle from the equine industry as our model. So we have placed these um, beams in the headpiece from the muzzle into the point of the shoulders to restrict head movement. These support bars are also in the body of our design and can strap to the downside uh, legs to restrict them from standing up. And to calm the patient, there's a weighted blanket embedded within our model and to calm the, to calm the patient with pressure. And so the level of calmness a patient is experiencing is actually measurable by the level of cortisol, the stress hormone in their blood that actually suppresses the immune system and lengthens the amount of time it takes to heal. So a, uh, in a, a calming environment not only uh, decreases, makes a less threatening uh, patient for you, but it also reduces the amount of healing time for the patient. Only two vet techs are required to transport a dog who's inside the safe snooze. Two handles are attached for security and control when transporting these animals. Our product is targeted as dogs from 50 to 100 pounds, but with further development, the safe snooze could be built in three sizes for dogs from 30 to 120 pounds. Also, this device would reduce the time for when the dog is immediately moved, removed from anesthesia to when it is safely in its kennel by itself recovering in its safe snooze. Our safe snooze. blood draws, and listening to the heart and lungs. So our safe snooze design has an outer cover that can be removed and separated from the inner weighted blanket. This makes the device very easy to wash, so, and this would be very helpful for technicians who like routinely perform uh, surgeries on dogs, and using this device repeatedly would, would make it more efficient for treatment in the hospital. Our team estimated that a safe snooze would cost from $160 to $300, depending on the size. It could also save vet clinics money as they reduce their employee compensations from animal attacks during recovery. This is unique and innovative because there is no full body canine restraint on the market like the safe snooze. This is made out of heavy duty Kevlar, which will provide support when transporting the animals, and waterproof nylon, which will, which will repel body fluids such as blood and urine, and inside is a removable, washable, weighted blanket to provide the calming sensation for the patient. From its materials to its application and recovery, the Safe Snooze protects the patient, the caretakers, and it saves time. You can even get multiple for your clinic. It really works. It even kept me calm. <laughs> so thank you for listening. So please join us so we can all have a Safe, safe Snooze. snooze. <laughs> All right, really good job. And judges, you have five minutes for questions. Great job, thank you all. Uh, the question that I had is that uh, when animals are recovering from anesthesia, they need to be monitored very, very closely. Uh, did you consider that and, and uh, how would you monitor the animal during recovery from anesthesia? I mentioned in one of the slides that the patient is easily accessible even if the device is on. Um, so all you need to do, you can have the ECG leads connected and everything after you move from place to place, you connect everything and then just put that blanket back on and whenever you need to go. Does that answer your question? Or, um, the animal is accessible through the cover, through one of the sides. So you, you can leave stuff on the IVs and it's easy to get to the legs and move the body while we're straining the head. Great job, really enjoyed that. A um, couple of questions, the handles, is that intended to lift the patient with the inside the, okay, so 
the handles? Yes, you can. Ultimately, you would have your hands under for support, okay. but they would be strong enough. They are on the underside, so you wouldn't be looking from the top side, so you can lift with along with hand support on the bottom. Mm -hmm. So that could be lifted with one side with your hand underneath, or this is just a prototype, so handles could be fashioned mm -hmm. in a better location to carry the dog. In. Okay. It's not going to be carried like a suitcase, like it looks right now. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Okay, good. And then the rough weight of the weighted, I love the idea of the weighted blanket and the comfort that that would bring. Roughly, how much does that end up making the prototype weigh with a weighted? Well, the different sizes would be different, but we found through research that about 10% of your body weight is what is most comforting. So for this range, this one was about 8 pounds. Okay. Excellent presentation. I have one question, uh, a little bit of a concern as to how you remove it when the dog is awake. And, and I just wondered a little bit about where the buckles are located around the head because I'm, once the dog's awake, then now you're at risk again. So can you address that? Yes, uh, we were hoping, like you could put a muzzle on it before or while it's awake in a different uh, prototype. You might have a hole in the back so you can fashion a muzzle on the animal while it's still in the safe snooze. Um, as well, and the straps are supposed to go under its chin and under its jowl, so you can easily get to it rather, so it's not too close to the jaws. So. The straps are also supposed to be quick release, so in case if the animal does start freaking out or struggling, you can quickly get it off, so it doesn't cause any more um, pain to the animal. Or not that it does cause pain, but cause pain to the animal. question about, um, you said the, the bottom limb restraints. Can you describe what those actually look like and how they're fashioned? I couldn't appreciate that from the, from the picture that was up. For sure. Okay, so they're weaved within the weighted blanket, so it's kind of like this metal beam, or they can even be wooden for it to be for here, and then I can show you on the inside actually. So the beam is underneath right here, and this leg strap would keep it connected to the weighted blanket from here so that they can't pull it up because it'll be like a stiff board basically that they're but just their bottom legs are stained to the downside legs. Does that make ground. sense? <laughs> it's a flimsy prototype but in reality or ideally this would be completely like almost board shape and this part would be the blanket type. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, the uh, next team is going to be How's Mike? How's my cow? Howdy, I'm Alan Suente and I'm a sophomore ITDE major. Howdy, my name is Lex Galindo, I'm a freshman in general engineering. My name is Faith Mitchell and I'm a freshman in general engineering. I'm Kenneth Musan, a senior in electrical engineering. I'm Christina Bohar, a sophomore animal science major. I'm Elena hutchins Dolly, and I'm a junior biomedical sciences major. I'm Chloe Benning, I'm a first year vet student. And we are How's My Cow? <laughs> If you were to put yourself in the position of a rancher, how would you feel if you had to drive out to check up on your cattle and you would end up finding one or many dead or severely ill? I, for one, would consider it a painful experience and something I would not like to go through often. 
Now consider the fact that modern day ranchers have to go through this exact scenario many times per year. These deaths and medical bills are major losses of income to these ranchers. On average, a 500 pound cow is valued at $725 when sold. Also, in 2015, the total loss of income due to cattle deaths and calf deaths was around $4 billion. A total of around 3.6 million cattle and calves were lost in 2015. 70% of these deaths could have been prevented if caught on time. That's where we come in. Cow wash could resolve this problem by simply monitoring the temperature, pulse, respiration rate, glucose levels, and location of the cattle. We would accomplish this by creating an ear tag for the cattle that would include a built-in silicon chip with multiple sensors. The types of sensors and attachments that we would use would be a GPS sensor, infrared sensor, and a temperature probe. Our product is to monitor the health of cows from a distance. Alright, so our device requirement would be that it would need to track the temperature, pulse, respiration levels, oxygen levels, and location of each cattle. It would also need to be customizable and should be able to connect with telemedicine. It should also be able to track the food habits and consumption of the cows, and lastly, it should not cost more than three dollars to produce. The three designs that we considered were the microchip, the neck collar, the cow watch. And we ultimately ended up going with the cow watch because it was the least expensive option and it was easier to produce. Our solution incorporates a reusable cattle tag that can be applied with a regular applicator. It has an infrared sensor which, which can be used to determine glucose levels, the pulse and oxygen levels within the blood to determine respiration rate. It will also have a temperature probe on the device in order to determine the temperature of the cow and a GPS monitor in order to track the exact location of each individual cow in relation to the herd and just individual herd names. We will pair it with a user-friendly phone app or and a base station or drum. The app that we created combines a user-friendly interface as well as the data collected from the cow watch so that the users can get their data easily without having to go through the extra struggle of learning how to use the programming software that goes behind the desk. So on the home page, we're able to track the data through the vitals. Um, it allows the users to see the battery usage as well as upload and view their medical records for their cattle. Um, on the next slide, we have the GPS tracker. So each of these pins represents a cow on your field. And then the highlighted cows represent um, cattle that have tra uh, traveled a little far from their herd this can sometimes um, mean that they are, uh, this sometimes means that they're suffering from an illness. They like to travel away from the rest of their herd. And then, um, here is the picture of our device. No, I'm sorry. Can you? So, and where the component is going to be placed on the ear tag. Since we are using the actual scale of the each component, we know exactly that everything can be fit on the ear tag. And at the first location, location number one, we're going to have GPS models that will allow us to track all the cow location. At location number two, since the temperature sensor need to be touched to the cow ear, it ha uh, we decide to place at the location number two. In order for IR sensor to provide us the data that we can use to determine the amount of oxygen, pulse, and expiration rate in the cow. Uh, the cow ear artery have to be between those devices, and that's the reason why we place them at location number three and number four. At location number five, we will have Wi-Fi model, which will allow us to transfer all the data back to our software. At location number six, we will have the microprocessor and battery, 9 voltage battery will be placed on the location number 7. This device will be able to operate at least a year without changing any battery. And since we know 
our uh, device requires the network connection. What happened to the farm that doesn't have any signal? We come up with two, solu two solutions. The first one is the base station, and the second one is the drone. The drone will be used on larger scale farms that have over 100 head of cattle or over 1,000 acres. So the drone will scan the pasture, the different type of terrain that the ranchers might not be able to get to, and then from the cow tag, the transmitter will pick up on the drone and then send the data to the app. There are other products out there that have some of this technology. However, they stick on just the temperature and the location of each individual cow. Beaver tags is just a regular ear tag in the ear with a temperature probe, and then cow lar is a collar around the neck. So our device and product is different because we can customize it for each different type of operation as well as different species. For example, the calcium levels in the blood as well as different ion levels can be measured through the IR sensor on the device and we can also track estrus detection with our device. Lastly, we will link the records from the vet to the app and the app data will also go to the veterinarian's records so that they will be able to see if there's any discrepancies. Okay, so looking at the financial aspect of our product, we were able to determine how much it'll take to produce these ear tags. And it can be as low as $11.04 per tag. Selling at $25 uh, a tag, we can get a um, profit of $560,000 with selling 40,000 initially. So looking at the cattle industry in the United States and assuming that we can attract about 20% and get their interest into our product, we can make $260 million based off the tags alone. Our subscription is also um, a great way to get profit as, since 400,000 ca uh, cattle producers is about 20% times the subscription cost and the years that they'll be using our product. We also have the sale of the drones and the base stations as well. So our business model, we plan to sell the cow watch along with the accessory products and the subscription plan. So the subscription plan would be a monthly or yearly charge for us to be able to maintain our product and for future development. We'd have a price breakdown based on the size of production as well as a discount for universities that are doing research with our product to get the market interested in our product and get more information for us to use. So our, we would have supplementary subscription plans based on what the producers are looking for with calcium detection and estrus tracking. Our vision for CowWatch is to connect producers to veterinarians and allow veterinarians to be able to utilize this product effectively and be able to communicate with their clients. We plan to have a small commission fee from the call cost so that we're able to keep developing our product more and that the veterinarian is still getting a good amount of the profit. So telemedicine is the evolving industry in our field. And so for that being said, we need to get it out there more. And we wanna be part of that. We wanna educate producers about this. And the average farm call cost is 75 to $100. If we can cut that by allowing veterinarians to only go to farm calls when it's actually necessary, and for us to be able to diagnose things through the product because the veterinarian could contact them directly. There are one sixth of the counties in the United States are underserved by veterinarians. Majority of these in rural counties. We wanna fix this. With this product, it would allow veterinarians to expand their range. They would be able to meet more people in more farms and thus we would have these underserved areas fixed. And so our app will allow you to do all of these things. So we identify problems, notify uh, producers, and connect to veterinarians. Thank you. Do you all have any questions? Thank you very much, Cal. <laughs> Judges, you have, you have five minutes for questions. Uh, great job and great problem and great solution. I, uh, the question I had is there are going to be a lot of data that are going to be generated. How will you manage the data? How will you use that to make decisions and that sort of thing? So our, the device can be set, customized by each producer on how much they want it to check. So our first one will be every six hours, but if they want to change it to 12 hours or only once a day or however much they would want it to go out and track the data, it's customizable so that it won't be taking it like every minute. 
Yeah. As well as uh, with temperature, for example, um, they already have some out there, but to be able to alert the producer if their temp if a certain a uh, head of cattle falls outside those te like healthy temperature ranges, it will alert them. And same with, um, and they can kind of customize what they want to be alerted to since there are certain problems within different operations. And with machine learning, we can actually have this technology identify what the normal range is for that specific herd to base on the environment. So the producer isn't getting notified when the temperature drops slightly because it's freezing outside. Good job, everyone. Uh, I have two questions, and they're more uh, about the concept and, and just wondering about have you guys thought of these. One is, um, have you thought about what the end result of the weight of the tag will be? A, a nine volt battery is pretty heavy. Um, so what do you estimate the final so weight? The nine volt battery is 0.1 pounds. And so that will be our heaviest component of the ear tag. And everything else we will, will be below that. So we think it will be less than half a pound. And the other products that are that we have sound as comparisons are all within that range of our weight, but we would definitely need to do animal testing just to ensure that it's not bothering the animals. And my second question um, refers to, my assumption is that the IR sensor is what you're thinking is going to collect um, information on estrus, respirations, pulse. And when you're saying that, I'm not familiar how respiratory rate can be collected. Are you talking about um, SpO2, or are you talking? What are what are the actual parameters that we you're looking for? We found research with blood oxygen levels and how that can relate to respiratory rate. We actually have a slide. There's an algorithm for it. There, is there was research to be able to determine um, a respiratory rate based off of oxygen saturation. You want to go to slide 24? <coughs> no, like they oh, can do it there. They can oh, do it. I'm sorry. 24. The one below. Okay. Can you go down one more? Okay, never mind. We, our slides are not. But we do have um, multiple research sources that have been published within 2017 and above stating that we can use this algorithm to effectively calculate respiratory rate. Will it also tell you SpO2 then as well? Yes, it should. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, a yeah, good presentation. Uh, Y'all lost me when we jumped from the, uh, I guess, the collection of data to reducing vet calls. I mean, the, the rancher, I mean, can you explain that again as to how uh, the collection of the data, the, the rancher could be collecting data anyway, how is that going to reduce uh, uh, farm calls? Oh, because it would. The app itself would have certain thresholds that if they're, if they're passed, it would notify the actual farmer to say, hey, this might actually be a real threat, instead of the rancher going out there and checking on the cow, like, oh, that looks, you know, it looks kind of sick. And it, would so prevent, would have, it would prevent the spread of disease, because if you identify one diseased animal earlier, you're going to prevent the spread to the other herd mates, as well as with telemedicine, as long as the client was, is a current client, it allows you to be able to do some diagnosis and treatment through communication on the phone. And so because the app would allow you to FaceTime with the veterinarian, they could send the data and have the image for the physical exam. And the veterinarian could actually guide the producer in how to assess the animal to get a diagnosis. So only farm calls would be needed when the veterinarian really needs their hands on the animal. Okay, thank you. Time for one more question, judges. Can you explain to me the subscription model? I was unclear what that, how that played into it. So, um, just with the app, we have this, uh, we want to have an annual subscription to, if you buy a tag, we want it to be, just as a side note, the first year free if you buy tags with us, and then after that we have an annual fee depending on the size of the farm, how many head of cattle, et cetera. This would allow you to be able to, any time? Okay. So this would allow the, us to be able to have the consistent revenue, revenue to find our research information and keep fixing our product to be the best it possibly can be. Okay, thank you very much. How's my cow? <laughs> the next team to present is under pressure. You will come forward under pressure.
team name is Under Pressure, and we are presenting Cat Stats. I'm Jill Starks. I'm a fourth-year veterinary student. I'm Shannon Wan. I'm a second-year veterinary student. I'm Chris Sung, a third-year BMN student. I'm Michelle Zerkar. I'm a junior mechanical engineering student. I'm Timothy Davis, a sophomore mechanical engineering student. I'm Sarah Abraham, a sophomore biomedical engineering student. Feline hypertension is defined as a systolic blood pressure greater than 160 millimeters of mercury. It's very common and about 57% of senior cats will develop hypertension. It's often secondary to other disease processes like chronic kidney disease and hyperthyroidism. Clinical signs are really subtle and hard for an owner to pick up on. It's similar to a cat version of a migraine, so they'll have light sensitivity, noise sensitivity, they'll be lethargic and hiding from the owners. The consequences of this are target organ damage to key places like the brain, the heart, the, the kidneys, and the eyes. The process of measuring blood pressure right now in cats is very stressful. This stress causes their blood pressure to go up. That makes it challenging for us to diagnose if a cat has hypertension or if they're just stressed. For example, my own cat recently developed chronic kidney disease and her blood pressure in the clinic is 170 millimeters of mercury. I don't know if I should treat her for hypertension or if she was just stressed. Here's a video showing how we currently measure high blood pressure in cats. This is Barney. Let's take Barney's blood pressure. To do that, you'll need blood pressure cuffs, a sphygmo manometer, ultrasound gel, and a Doppler probe. To start, you'll need to place the appropriately sized cuff snugly around the cat's arm. Put plenty of ultrasound gel onto the Doppler probe and place the probe on the skin at the base of the paw pad. Turn on the Doppler probe and hunt for a pulse. Squeeze the sphygmo manometer until you no longer hear the pulse. Slowly decrease the pressure in the cuff, and the first sound you hear is the systolic blood pressure. Repeat this five to seven times for accuracy. That was the ideal scenario. In reality, have a limit, they reach that very quickly with Doppler blood pressures. If they have a weak pressure, you really can't find it. You're going to spend a good 10 minutes just kind of roaming the back of the foot around. You have to make sure that you have the right cuff size and they don't like gel on their foot and squeezing of the cuff and things like that. To be able to take blood pressure on a cat. As Jill just said, the main confounding factor when it comes to being able to diagnose hypertension is stress. So we don't know if it's actually hypertension or if it's just high blood pressure. And so we want to be able to minimize the amount of handling that we do on our cats. So therefore be able to minimize the stress and therefore be able to diagnose hypertension when it's actually hypertension. So when we were coming up with design alternatives, the first thing we thought of was a wearable collar or an ear tag um, that would somehow be able to convert heart rate and into blood pressure. And the other idea we came up with was a wireless blood pressure cuff, which essentially just kind of minimizes, um, combines all those elements that you saw in the video. But ultimately, we thought that these two still ended up with too much handling, and so ultimately, we came up with CatStats, which is an implantable device and app that together allows for easy and accurate diagnosis of feline hypertension. So on our five design requirements, the first one is accuracy. We have to make sure that compared to the gold standard for arterial lines, that has to be less than five millimeters of mercury. For our next one is safety. While the implant is in the cat, we have to make sure that it is biocompatible and that the cat can't reach it or rip it out. The next one is uh, fast surgical implantation. We have to make sure that the surgery is under 30 minutes. Our fourth one is a long lifespan. Our product is about 10 years long. 
And the last one is accessible data, making sure that the user has the access on the phone so they can directly read what the blood pressure of the cat is. The Cat Stats implant and app provides owner with the measurements of their cat's vitals so they can be proactive about their cat's health. This implant will be placed in the back of the neck and it will not only measure blood pressure but also heart rate and ECG. Our target patients are healthy to young and uh, healthy young and to middle-aged cats and um, this procedure will be done during elective procedures such as spaying, neutering, and dental procedures. So as Richelle said, our device is going to be resting in the back side of the neck of a cat. Our device will contain two different types of sensors, two electrodes on the end and a light sensor or a PPG in the center. We will be using the electrodes to gen generate an ECG so we can study the electroactivity of the heart and using the light sensor to study the blood vessel movement near the muscle. Rather than using a manual cuff to measure the blood pressure and approximate it, we can accurately calculate the blood pressure of these two inputs. Allow me to introduce you to Mr. Whiskers. So say one day you want to take Mr. Whiskers' blood pressure. All you do is open your CatStats app, select the scan button, and then place your smartphone about one to two feet away from the back of the neck. You leave the smartphone there for about 10 seconds, and then your app will refresh and it'll display the blood pressure, the heart rate, and, as, and the ECG at that moment. The app also allows you to view trends for the week. So for instance, in this case, the user has selected blood pressure, and you can see the trends for blood pressure that week. Also, the app allows you to view um, future appointments, as well as uh, an emergency call to the veterinarian if needed. We approximated the manufacturing cost of this device to be $50, and we set the selling point to the vets at $120. With these values, we have a pr profit margin of 71%, and with further research and optimization, we expect this to increase more. Now, who here thinks there's more cats or dogs in the US? It's kind of close, right? You'd be surprised. There's actually 95.6 million household cats in the US. And if we assume that 75% of these cats can receive veterinary care, Penetrating 5% of this market will generate us $430 million in revenue. So in search of our solution, we actually got more than what we bargained for. CatStats is more than just a new way to measure blood pressure in a cat. It's a new way to see cat health care in general. Accelerometers, thermometers, respiratory monitors. These are all existing technologies that are just a software update away from implementation. CatStats can be as involved or as discreet as you make it. There's also a lot of clinical uses for veterinarians, such as anesthetic monitoring. If you have an emergency case that comes in and you want to know what that cat's vitals were before they came in, you can see that. And on top of that, if you have a critical case, you can better able, you're better able to get a pulse when you're otherwise not able to feel it at the end of their paw. Although our device does require surgical implantation, when you compare it to the currently existing models out there, it surpasses them in every way. It's wireless, you can measure trends long term, you can measure trends while they're at home and not stressed, and it's accurate. In the future, we hope to implement this in other types of species, such as domestic, other domestic animals, or even zoo animals. Also, improving the lifespan to be a little bit longer than 10 years. Thirdly, increasing the range so you don't have to be so close to your cat when trying to get a reading. And lastly, getting real-time updates so you can get notifications to your phone, or even getting a live feed of what your cat's vitals are like. CatStats is a novel and innovative device that will revolutionize feline healthcare. It allows cat owners to proactively participate in their cat's health as opposed to responding to problems when they arrive. We'd love to take this product to market and we greatly value your help to get us there. Thank you so much. Judges, you have five minutes for questions. I think you all did a really great job, so thank you for that, and you're, you showed that you put a lot of thought into collecting your data. Um, one thing that kind of made my eyes go a little bit big was your cost. You think about, um, I liked how you said that your target of implant was during an elective spay or neuter. You think about a low-cost shelter or a spay and neuter clinic may charge 60 to $80 for a spay or neuter for a small animal, and if you're selling it to the veterinarian for 120, my estimate would be they would implant it for probably a fee on top of that. So a vet may be charging their client 150, which is more than double the cost of the spay. Um, do you have any alterations to the product that may bring that cost down? 
So this method of uh, developing calculating the blood pressure does require a lot of electronics, and although it's still young, there's still a lot of room for development. So as development increases, sizes of electronics will get smaller and more efficient to manufacture, so that's the way the price will decrease. Yeah. And to add on to that, microtechnology is like an ever advancing market, and you can just expect like sizes to get smaller and prices to get cheaper just as time progresses. Outstanding presentation. Thank you. Um, I know that during your development, you were talking about inserting this intramuscularly. Um, and I'm wondering, since that really wasn't mentioned in their presentation, has that changed? Is it now a subcutaneous, or is it still an intramuscular product? The device will still be placed intramuscularly in the brachiocephalicus muscle at the top of the back of the neck of the cat. Did you run across a human prototype for this? There was not a human prototype. There was actually a sheep study that implemented this sort of technique, and it was efficient and accurate in blood pressure calculations also. And although it wasn't directly humans or animals, the methodology of calculating the blood pressure using two different physio physiological signals has been studied before and accepted. Very good. Quick question. So the, back to the price side, uh, one way I think that would help that look better potentially is not having a subscription on top of that. But it's a one it, that, that fee includes the technology, the updates that are going to happen every year or whatever happens there. What, are, what do you all envision as far as subscription and fees for that for your service? Uh, we just envisioned just the upfront cost, the initial cost, um, and we didn't have a subscription model. Okay. I have a question about the scanning. Is it when, multiple times per day whenever you choose to do it, there was something on your matrix about continual scanning? Yeah, so it's continuous in the fact that you can scan it throughout their life. You don't have to just measure for one day and then you have to take the catheter out and it's done. You can measure it whenever you want to. Um, so it's continuous in that you can do it whenever, not necessarily every second of the day we're measuring the blood pressure. Okay, under pressure. Thank you so much. Very good. The next presentation is bad to the bone. All right, now bad to the bone. Howdy. 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 I'm Oriana Camera, a freshman general engineer major. My name is Diego Contreras. I am a business honors and accounting junior. My name is Jonathan Gehring. I'm a junior mechatronics engineering major. My name is Luke Hibner. I am a general engineering freshman. I'm Galilea Puente, a sophomore ITDE major. I'm Jasmine Rizagi, a sophomore chemical engineering major. I'm Sarah Salinas, a senior biomedical science major. And we are Adaptive Board. Save time, save money, save lives. There are over 185 million dogs and cats in the United States alone. Man's best friend and their furry feline companions have become an integral part of the family for 65% of U.S. households. 42 million of those animals will die from cancer. 6 million dogs and 6 million cats were diagnosed with cancer in 2019. That works out to one in four dogs and one in five cats that suffer from this terrible disease. This problem is even worse for older house pets as more than 50% of dogs and cats over 10 years old will get some form of cancer. Currently, radiation therapy is one of the most common methods of treating cancer in these cases. However, this process as it stands today is not safe, out of date, and cost inefficient. 
Oncologists are expected to jury rig animals in place during radiation, causing the animal's position to vary from session to session. This misalignment often results with the patient needing another scan, costing the owner over $800. Misaligned treatment could cause negative health effects such as radiation burns in surrounding areas. Inaccuracy can mean ineffective treatment of a tumor. To solve these problems, we created Adaptaboard, a unique harness system that humanely and precisely immobilizes animals throughout their radiation sessions. So join our team. Together we can save time, save money, and save lives. So cancer is the leading cause of deaths in dogs and cats. Radiation is used as above, on over half of the cancer patients and involves 5 to 20 daily treatments. Radiation treatment also includes reproducible positioning and currently only human equipment is used. The problem we are solving is precisely immobilizing animals during radiation treatments. The reason why we have to make sure and improve the method that is being used today is because the method that is being used today requires that vets and vet techs take daily scans that are needed for the, for the pets to ensure that they are in the same position for their treatment. And as Jasmine mentioned, that can sometimes range from 5 to 20 separate times. Um, if, the, if the patient is misaligned, that could also lead to the vet and the vet, uh, the vet team missing a tumor or misaligning a tumor. And this could increase toxic, toxicity levels in normal tissues, which means that the skin that shouldn't be under radiation is exposed to radiation. To give you a better idea on how poor current situations are for these animals, there's little to no indexing on any of the equipment they use for these animals. So, and sometimes maybe only one axis. In some cases, they use a V-shaped trough laying the animal across on their spine, which could hurt the animal, as well as their arms and legs can flail around, making it hard to keep them still. Also, all the equipment that they are using for these animals are just jury-rigged from human components that they use. And none of these equipment have any way of immobilizing arms or legs during treatment. In order to lack these, in order to tackle these requirements, we came up with five requirements. In order to tackle these complications, we came up with five requirements. The first and most important one was that we needed it to produce reproducible and precise results. Then it needs to have modularity to it because we're treating both cats and dogs that both have different breeds with the same machine. It needs to be reusable and cleanable, improve patient comfort, and be cost and time efficient in order for the, pet, in order for the vets to want to use it. So to give you a breakdown on our three possible solutions for this problem. Initially we were going to improve upon one of the current ways they're solving this using a vacuum pad. By doing that, we would lay the animal across an uh, inflatable mattress type material that would then suck the air out, forming the shape to the animal's body. The problem with this, however, is when you're moving animals to and from the pads, their claws or teeth might scrape or cut or break the material, having to throw the whole thing away uh, and costing the vet money. The second idea is using a pin screen similar to the toy shown on the screen. This, the animal would lay across the table and these pins would rise to fit the mold and shapes of these animals. The problem with this idea is that the pins could pinch or pull and hurt the animal as well as maybe difficult to clean each individual pin. Our third and main choice is the adapter board, which is a pin style setup. So in this setup, we have a board laid out with pins, index, in alphabetical order, and numbers in rows and columns. This should make it so the vet techs can simply look at an Excel spreadsheet and know where to put each module on the board. We also have hard foam pads that would lay across these pads to help hold the chest and groin regions, as well as cradle the arms and legs to keep the animals secure and safe. And then finally, we are improving upon the current mouth mold, which only holds the top upper head. We would also add a bottom jaw part and then a secure strap down here that would secure the head and lock it into place. Our product has several other applications, such as imaging and neurosurgical procedures. As for our next steps, we plan on introducing different size cushions for different size weight classes of different animals. These weight classes will go from teacup to small, medium, large, and then finally giant. The model that we have in front of you right here, our prototype, is in the large class, the 50 to 75 pound range. And we also plan on conducting further material testing. Our model right here contains little metal in it, but in our final product, we will have no metal in it whatsoever. That way it can also go through all types of imaging. We also plan to ensure that it is safe and efficient to implement within a veterinary setting 
That way the vet tech and veterinary have a streamlined process throughout the whole time. Also, we plan to increase the board precision since the gaps on this board right here are one inch in between. We plan on shrinking that down to one centimeter. That way, the animals are held more stably and more comfortably. As you can see on this 3D model rendering right here, we have the chest plate and the pelvic plate. Those are the two things that will change depending on the size of the animal. Everything else will be indexable and set to a certain amount. That way, all the vet tech has to do is strap it in the first time, take down the measurements, and then every time after that that the animal comes in, it can be strapped down to the exact same measurements, and that way we get reproducible settings and the best patient care. So one of the most important things we wanted to evaluate when looking at this product was see if there was an actual viable market for us to use this product in. Our starting point was actually uh, clinics both in the U.S. and in Texas that have veterinary uh, oncology uh, services available and we found 227 in the U.S. and 13 such in Texas, one of them very close by. Six million dogs and six million cats get diagnosed yearly, so there's obviously a big problem for that and even it is the leading cause of death in 47% of dogs and 32% of cats. We would like to thank the Aggies and Vince staff and Dr. Smith and Dr. DeVoe for their help and Ruby. Ruby is the dog that we pictured in the 3D pro uh, prototype that we used during our video. And that is why we want to ask everyone here to help support our team. There are millions of cats and dogs out there that need our help. And I know that together we can save time, save money, and save lives. Thank you so much. We're going to open up the floor to questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And judges, you have five minutes for questions. We saw the, the pictures. Could you point out here uh, and describe it, the, the prototype a, a little more? Yes, ma'am. So right here we have, this would be our wrist straps, and then this is going to be our kind of chest cavity. Back here we're going to have a pelvic plate. Uh, this is also going to be a disposable plastic wrap over this, which will help with the cleaning of it. This is a back plate right here. We're going to have two of those, an upper back plate and then the lower back plate to help support the pelvis as well. Right here we have the two rear straps for the rear hind legs. Right here we have both the top and the bottom, different mouth guards, which is something that they don't currently have right here. There's also going to be a hole in there for an intubation tube while the animal is anesthetized. And then right here we have the chin guard to further stabilize the head and neck area. Yes, One more aspect to that I'd like to add is that both the, the, all the piping that you see will have the crutch system available for it so that you can index it whether you, the animal has a larger snout or a snort, uh, smaller snout, so forth and so on. Uh, quick question. How, how long is the animal in the device? Um, treatments normally go about 15 to 20 minutes depending on how large of a section that the radiation is going to be hitting. And of course, you're, you have the waiting time after um, they're done with the treatment, they're gonna start waking up the animal, so they'll have to wait for the, uh, to pull out the intubation tube until the animal starts, is conscious and is able to breathe by itself. Nice graphics, I enjoyed it all there. Uh, the question I have is with trying to move that around with the patient, what, is the, what do you anticipate the weight is of your prototype that will work? Since we're going to depend on using plastics and carbon fibers for this, um, we are estimating probably around 10 pounds or so, and what they currently use is like 20 or 30, and it's very it's very hard to move from place to place, so this will definitely be an improvement. Okay, bad to bone, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take about a 15 minute break uh, so that everybody can kind of get up and move around. We will be right back. Thank you very much.
Welcome back. We are ready to start the second half of the presentation and we're going to start this off with PADGUARD. Howdy. We're PADGUARD and our mission is protecting the patient in the PAD. I'm Andrew Litzinger. I'm Megan Sheffield. Emily Wiley. I'm Samar Sanchez. I'm Dr. Bitcoin. I'm Brian Wong. Here's a quick video demonstrating the challenges that veterinarians face in the field. You take your beloved animal to the vet clinic for routine spay or neuter and expect them to come home safe and healthy, but that's not always the case. Research found that 82% of veterinary teaching hospitals reported outbreaks of infectious diseases. The agents most commonly detected were salmonella, staph infections, and E. coli. Infections can be transferred from the staff or the environment by inadequate attention to cleanliness and sterile techniques during wound management. Most of the diseases are transmitted when the patient is undergoing and recovering from surgery. During this time, the patient's body temperature is below normal, making it more susceptible to major health complications. A 2012 study found that 84% of dogs undergoing surgery experience low core body temperature. The same research team discovered that the percentage of hypothermia in cats to be 97% in an earlier study. Even a decrease of 2 to 4 degrees Fahrenheit in core temperature can lead to major heart complications, surgery site infection, and prolonged recovery. Let's maintain patient's normal body temperature with a heating pad. Heating pads are often covered with a garbage bag or a cotton-like fabric. However, these covers can be perforated by the patient's nails or surgical instruments and can expose the pad to bodily fluids throughout surgery, possibly spreading disease or damaging the pad and its wiring. So we need to help vets uh, keep the equipment clean. So we design an improved protective cover for heating pads in the use of veterinary clinics. In order to, for this to be uh, successful, we needed a heating pad cover that prevented bodily fluids from touching the, the pad, a scratch, a and tear the pad, or cover, sorry, no folds or creases, that it's reusable, compatible with cleaning chemicals and able to be sterilized. And we wanted a material that conducts heat. Okay, so current products available to veterinary clinics to cover the and cooling pads are trash bags. They're about 10 cents each and they're waterproof but they are not um, scratch resistant or autoclavable. And they do have folds and creases which make it harder to completely clean it. And so, and they are disposable too, which adds to the landfill. So the next product is a flannel cover. They're about $15 per unit. They are not scratch resistant, waterproof, or autoclavable, but they are reusable. And the last product is a protective pad, and they're about $54 a unit. They are scratch resistant, but not waterproof or autoclavable, but they are reusable. Uh, so pad guard is made from Teflon, which is a Teflon fabric which is easily autoclavable and chemically cleanable. It can be easily removed like as shown. It has, uh, it has Velcro, uh, Velcro uh, inside it to, so to adjust for adjustable sizes. Uh, also, it, it can be easily inserted into the cover and we have provided for two different buttons on the each side of the zipper uh, to provide for the cord positioning uh, as, as per the requirements of the heating pad cord. Uh, Moreover, the uh, zipper provides for a complete sealing of the heating pad of the heating pad, thus protecting the heating pad. The heating pad cover does not allow any fluids to go inside the uh, inside it, so thus protecting the heating pad from bodily fluids of the animal. The heating pad, moreover, is scratch resistant, and thus it uh, it is protecting the heating pad from the animal claws and surgical instruments. This is a clearly a very uh, uh, good enhancement over the previous products. So we had three, or we developed three designs for our heating pad cover. Our first design was made out of PVC, uh, which was disposable. Um, we did not, even though this was a cheaper option, we did not choose this as it was not sustainable. Uh, it could not be easily cleaned uh, before use. And we also had issues with our ceiling. Our second design, we used Teflon and to keep uh, 
To maintain a proper seal, we decided to use a zipper. However, we did not go with the second design because it could only fit one size pad, or heating pad. Our current design, which is here, um, was expanded upon from our second design. In our third design, we added, as mentioned before, Velcro, Velcro straps to accommodate for different size heating pads. So without our innovative product, the number of pets that get infected while they're in the hospital will remain the same. Um, they can get infected um, from diseases such as salmonella, which can be transferred through the heating pad. Um, and because of that, they'll have a longer and more complicated hospital stay, um, which will result in uh, owners <coughs> losing trust in the veterinary practice and the veterinary practice losing business and losing money. It's estimated that uh, veterinary teaching hospitals alone uh, lose four, over $4 million per year due to these hospital-acquired infections. And if a heating pad is damaged and needs to be replaced, it can cost anywhere from $150 to more than $1,000 based on the type of heating pad used and the brand. So we estimated in order to solve this problem, we would need uh, it would cost around $23 per unit to produce our product. And we decided that a good uh, price to sell it at would be around $41. And of course, uh, these prices can be decreased the more products we produce. And now I'm sure you're asking yourself, why invest in PadGuard? Well, first of all, there are around 125 million animal surgeries in the U.S. each year. Uh, and each, each one of these surgeries will require, will require a heating pad to protect the animal during surgery. There are about 30,000 vet clinics in the U.S., and if you look at this number, we could estimate about a $3.5 million revenue from this product. And another thing to keep in mind is that vet clinics do multiple surgeries at a time, so some of these vet clinics will require multiple pad guards. Uh, so we're, we're really excited about this product. We're thankful y'all came to, to see this, this product and how, how it can improve the, the veterinarian field as of right now. So we're PadGuard and our mission is protecting the patient in the pad and we hope that's your mission as well. Thanks Thank you very much, PadGuard. All right, Doug, you have five minutes for questions. It doesn't really feel like there's actually a cover on it. It's pretty transparent to it. So the temperature that the heating pad actually is is pretty much the same temperature on the outside, just in the animal. So it, conduct, it conducts the heat well, and it does Definitely. it pretty quickly. Yes. Definitely. I had a similar question about how you chose this substance, and actually what is it, and, and uh, how how do you know it has all the characteristics that you mentioned? Because you had some criteria that you wanted, but how to, uh, t tell us a little bit more about how that provides all of those. Yeah, we have a slide. Yeah, we have a slide. Do you know what number? Oh, it's like a number. Yeah, it's like a number. Okay. So an autoclave is usually 121 degrees Celsius, which is about 250 degrees Fahrenheit. And so the Teflon actually has a melting point at 621 degrees Fahrenheit. So it would survive in an autoclave and it would be fine to sterilize. So that was the main point of why we picked it. Also, Teflon is hydrophobic, so fluids won't stay on it. That was, one of, that was another main point that we were looking for. I'm really excited about this. The, the, just in practice, what I've experienced so many times. The, tell me what's, what's driving the high cost on it, though. It seems it appears fairly simple. The zippers, the, but the snaps. Tell me more about the cost. So currently, I think our most expensive item would be the top one. Okay. Yeah. Um, if we could find some place to buy bulk, it would probably reduce the cost. Okay. And so as going forward, the more products that we sell, the distributors will give us a lower cost, so we can pass it on to the veterinary clinic too. Good. I mean, the, the sell price doesn't seem too out of line. Mm -hmm. If it could come down just a little bit under the 40 mark, that'd be really all right, judges, thank you so much. Fan guard, thank you very much.
The next team is Quick Cut. Take it away, Quick Cut. Good afternoon, we are Quick Cuts. My name is Emily, I'm an animal science sophomore. I'm Emily, I'm a biomedical engineering senior. I'm Jennifer, I'm a second year veterinary student. I'm Abby, I'm a biomedical engineering senior. I'm John Paul, I'm a general engineering freshman. I'm Patty, I'm a sophomore biology major. The problem we are solving is avoiding blood vessels in a dog's nails while training. We have a quick video for you guys before we get started. Working in the veterinary world, nail trims are an important part of the business, but can be difficult. Dogs are uncooperative and often need multiple handlers. Nails fly into the air when cut, sometimes landing in eyes, mouths, and down shirts. The more serious part of this problem, however, is the pain that is unintentionally inflicted on dogs while getting their nails trimmed. The location of a dog's blood vessel, called the quick in the nail, is easily misjudged, especially if they have black nails. If the quick is cut, the dog will experience intense pain, discomfort, and bleeding. For too long, dogs have suffered through painful nail trims, but at long last, a solution has arrived. Quick Cuts is an innovative nail clipper that reduces stress for both healthcare providers and our beloved dogs. Simply insert the dog's nail and Quick Cuts quickly and accurately cuts the nail to the correct length. Our temperature sensor detects the difference between nail and the Quick and cuts the nail to the optimal length. The bottom compartment collects nail clippings for easy disposal. The canister is easily adjusted to accommodate a variety of nail sizes, ensuring all dogs can have a pain-free experience. Quick Cuts is easy, safe, and affordable. So do yourself and your patients a favor and try Quick Cuts today. As you saw in the video, the current approach to trimming dog's nails is not very effective. It usually takes multiple people to do, it can take a really long time, and the nail trimmings are not neatly collected. Also, without having an accurate indication of where the quick ends, you have to use your best judgment as to how much nail is trimmed. This often leads to accidentally cutting the quick, which is extremely painful to the dogs. In order to solve the problems of the current approach, we have devised a list of five basic requirements that our device must meet. The automatic blade must have safety measurements in place so that it will not cut when body temperature is detected. It must be able to cut all 20 nails on one dog in five minutes or less. It must be affordable to veterinarians, vet techs, and groomers, ranging from $250 to $400. It must accurately cut the nails 99% of the time without reaching the quick, and it must be able to work on dog sizes ranging from 5 pounds to 150 pounds. In order to solve the problem of cutting a dog's nails without cutting the blood vessel inside, we came up with three different ideas. The first is a color changing nail coating that the owner would apply to the dog's nail. The color would change based on the temperature of the nail, so it would be different between the blood and where there's just solid nail. The owner would then cut at the color demarcation between these two to detect the correct length. Our second um, idea was to couple a, a magnetic and an infrared temperature sensor together into our product. An automatic blade would then come out when the optimal length was reached and cut the nail at that length every time. 
Our third idea was just this temperature and this magnetic sensor attachment to be attached to a pair of already existing clippers that the owner can use. And when the, the sensor detects the optimal length, the owner will manually cut the clip uh, nails. So our solution is Quick Cuts, an innovative device that detects where the quick ends and automatically cuts the nail at the perfect location. To use Quick Cuts, simply insert the dog's nail into the chamber. Our innovative infrared and magnetic sensor will detect where the blood vessel is located inside the nail and where there's just solid nail. The color indicator light will change from red to green when this area is uh, achieved and the uh, technician will know not to put the nail in any further. Our automatic blade will then come across and cut the nail at the precise length every time away from the quick. This blade can be replaced, changed, and cleaned uh, multiple times in the method. There's also a container that the nail clippings can all be collected in after the nail trimming is done. This container can be removed and it can be placed directly in the trash can so you don't have nails littering your veterinary office. So we tested the magnetic and infrared sensors on both white and black nails and on nails that were large and small. What we found in this was that Combining the two sensors together provided for a more robust detecting mechanism to locate where the quick ends and where just the nail bed begins. This, our initial data showed that our proof of concept does work and further testing in better testing environments would of course need to be done to increase the accuracy of our device. The market for our product consists of vets, technicians, and groomers. Currently in the United States, there are over 100,000 grooming facilities and there are 28,000 to 32,000 vet clinics. Spending in the pet market industry has increased by 4.4% from 2017 to 2018, which is equivalent to about $73 billion. From those $73 billion, $15 billion went into vet services while $5 billion went into grooming and boarding. We took time to look at what our competitors had out in the market, and what we found was that there was no product out there that was capable of detecting the quick and dark nails and effectively cut it without being able, or without cutting the quick and causing the dog to bleed. Your traditional nail trimmer requires for the user to use their own sight to determine where they want to make the cut and requires strength in order to make that cut. The Dremel style grinder is a loud and noisy mechanism that will make your dog feel stressful and it takes a while because you're literally grinding down the nail to the length that you want it to be. Lastly, the product Quick Finder is able to determine the quick but only in light nails. For dark colored nails, it's not capable of doing that. Unlike these products, our products include the innovative inclusions of an automatic blade that comes out at the precise length that we want it to be replaceable and removable blades that can be used to switch out blades and to, sanitize, and to sterilize them. And lastly, our coupled sensors, which will give us the accurate measurement we need in order to make that cut, making Quick Cuts the best nail cutter out there in the market. In order to make our product more convenient for the consumer, we decided to include um, replacement blades along with the trimmer model. The replacement weights are going to be around $15, while the trimmer is going to be from $250 to $400. The vet can replace the blades every six months or so, depending on how much you use it. Since the average dog requires $180 worth of nail trims per year, or $2,400 for their lifetime, it is an excellent investment for vets. In the future, we plan to make the product available to all pet owners. We also want to expand to other types of animals, and we would like to add sounds to the device so visually impaired individuals could also operate it. Thank, Thank you for listening. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much. Judges, <laughs> you have five minutes for questions. Great job and a real need. This is a real need. Uh, did you uh, talk at all about 
the movement of the dog and how this would work as the dog is pulling away because they don't like their nails done, right? Yeah. So tell, tell us about how you would manage uh, movement of the animal while the procedure is being done. Sure. So um, as we explained before, there's uh, going to be a slight delay between when the nail is inserted and when the actual cut is. That's to ensure that the technician is putting the nail and don't push it in too far or anything. But it will be pretty instantaneously once the dog's nail is in there. So they all need to sit still for a few seconds. If the dog does move, they won't um, push the nail further in. They'll be, be moving to pull it out, so it's not really a safety concern of the dog getting cut by the blade. It's more of you have to try again because the dog pulled out their ball too fast for you. Nice work there. I'm excited about this one also. Um, all of them, they're amazing. Um, so the blade, I want to know just a little bit more information on how that blade works within that, that cylinder. Um, because I'm picturing the nail kind of being really, really loose in there. What do the nail in place while the blade is I may have missed something. So I'm just picturing the blade coming across and push the nail along with the blade. Mm -hmm. What's cool? Please explain. Um, so we are envisioning selling one model uh, of the nail trimmer, and it will come with these individual casings that you can put into the nail trimmer for, uh, for different sized dogs. So the bigger dog will have the normal model, and then as you get smaller and smaller, you insert uh, inserts that will make the diameter smaller so that the, the dog's toenail will be not tight in there because they wouldn't like that if you hold onto their toe real tight, but snug enough that it won't have enough room to move around. So I'd like to follow up a little bit on this. Problem to approach because it's been a big deal for a long time. Um, I, I do have some concerns about what's driving the blade. I, you acknowledged in one of your prototypes that you didn't use that, that or, or one of the other things that's on the market that it requires a lot of force from mm -hmm. the operator. And I just kind of wondered what's driving that that blade because in, in a lot of big dogs, those nails are really yeah. substantial and it's going to take a lot of force to cross that. And then second question is related to cost. And I think this is illustrative of difference in veterinarians. I was fine with the $40 for the, for the, for the heating bed cover, but $200 for this product, it makes me a little nervous. So if someone could speak to that as well. So I can address the blade part first. Um, so the blade mechanism would be spring-loaded, kind of similar to um, a switch blade. So you, when the sensor detects the difference that this part up here is blood vessel and this part down here is just nail, it'll say, yeah, okay, to the switch, and then the blade will come out and cut right so it does have the spring-loaded mechanism in it, so it is uh, pretty powerful. Okay. And fast. Yes. As far as the price goes, we believe with the innovation and accuracy that our device has to offer, that veterinarians would be willing to pay the price for it because it would be a one-time upfront investment, but it would save their business money over a long period of time, and it would also improve the care of their patients. I have a, a question about the actual, um, you know, determining where you are on the nail. You said that it would go from red to green, but to me it seems like as you insert the nail, you're in a green zone and you would hit a red zone, if you will. So, it, you know, how does it, how does it know? I'm really glad you asked that question. If you go to the next slide, it shows our data. Um, so that's the reason why we coupled the magnetic sensor with the IR temperature sensor to really accurately know when that like line of demarcation is with, okay, this is where the, na or the blood vessel is ending and then this is where the nail bed is beginning. And we would program it to where it cuts a specific millimeter length after that point. So it's highly accurate and of course, you know, um, adjustable enough to work with all different nail sizes and colors as well, and then answer your question. I, I, I'm still unclear because I'm, as a pet owner, let's mm -hmm. say, I'm putting the nail in and it says red, 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 and then I put it in so far because it's getting close to the quick, it's gonna say green, so what if I'm just too quick and I keep going, what mechanism is it that says no, 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 you've gone too far? So it, the, um, the blade just won't work. So if you do go too far, that's one of the safety measures, is if the sensors continue to sense that there is um, body temperature in there and you, know, you put the nail in too far, the blade mechanism just will not execute. 
So you know you could keep putting the nail in, and you know even if it's too far in, it just won't work. And the okay, thank you very much. Sorry, I hate to do this. Thank you, quick cut. All right, the next team is vet rest. Rest. Howdy. 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 We are Vet Rest, the ultimate animal restraint device that provides rest for both the pet and the vet. My name is Prashant Janu, and I'm the data analyst. I'm Ronnie Nathani, research expert. Francisca Moreno, prototype analyst. Vivian Yu, video expert. Noble Gutierrez, mechanical design expert. Ian Suarez, CAD designer. And now let's take a look at our video. The dog stirs awaken. He is swarmed by masses of unfamiliar people in bright lights. He feels trapped in the storm of noise. As he struggles to get on his feet, he hears panicked voices. The tubes dig further in as the unfamiliar people press down harder. Confused and in pain, the dog resorts to his strongest defense. It bites down. Monitoring pain during the recovery process is extremely important as some pets may become aggressive and become a danger to both the veterinarian and the pet itself. 47% of canine anesthesia mortalities and 60% of failing anesthesia mortalities occur in the post-operative period. Currently, veterinarians use towels over the patient's neck to help prevent the animal from becoming overwhelmed by their surroundings. However, these techniques have resulted in injuries to the veterinarian as well as even increased aggressive behavior among the patients. Introducing VetRest, an innovative way to comfortably restrain pet recovering from anesthesia post-operative while reducing veterinarians' need to constantly overlook the animal's recovery process. Our unique design guarantees the safety of both the patient and the veterinarian. An adjustable frame and mesh system accommodates pets ranging from 5 to 200 pounds. With one vet rest unit, veterinarians can oversee the safe recovery of most dogs, cats, and other small animals for over a decade. 50% of animals who have died during surgery died within three hours of the procedure ending. And 83% of veterinary team members have stated that they have been bitten by animals in their veterinary practice. This becomes an even larger problem as there are, 26, as there are more than 26,000 animal clinics here in the United States, which reflects the large amount of danger posed. So this leads into our need statement. How can we most effectively restrain animals after surgery to keep both the veterinary and the pet itself safe? We have narrowed our scope down to animal clinics in the United States. So we currently have five requirements. Weight accommodation, we need to hold animals of, or companion pets of small to large, which would be about five pounds to 200 pounds. It needs a mouthpiece for steering so dogs can't bite people whenever they're in the restraint. That's capable with standing about 700 PSI. The dimensions of the table need to be about the same size as current medical practitioners' tables. It has to be capable of restraining the companion pet on the three, on the three major positions, back, side, and stomach. And it, has to be easy to use with no more than one vet tech capable of setting it up and adjusting. So our initial design was a snapping table that utilized Velcro straps over a V-shaped table. This ha design, however, was pretty, wasn't very innovative because Velcro straps are very prominent in the industry already. Our other design was a ceiling cable re restraint system that utilized restraints over the pet's paws. This, however, didn't allow for the the animal to be comfortable because the most common recovery position that's most comfortable to pets is on its side. Introducing our innovative solution, we finally put forward a solution that addresses the comfortably customizable and safe problem that other products on the market don't address. Our product, VetRest, offers four key features. One, 
the mesh system that's made out of nylon. And nylon is perfect because it is comfortable, it is tear resistant, and it is cheap. We also offer a bite guard, which is a better alternative than a, a muzzle because it allows for one, an incubation, intubation tube that allows uh, the tube to go into the mouth freely during the post-operation process. Also, it has, offers a universal fit, unlike most muzzles. We also have an adjustable table height for, to accommodate any size animal. And we have a motor system, which increases or decreases the tension in the mesh. So with this system, you can accommodate most sizes of animals. In this video, we demonstrate putting the animal within the mesh. And it is tear resistant, but it's easy to cut with nylon. So you simply fit the appendages through the holes, and it's fully customizable. Next, we show the motor system increasing the tension for smaller animals, and next, decreasing the tension for larger animals. We also feature sliding bars, which caress the animal into a taco to keep it safe and restrained. So how do we compare to our competition? How are we going to go into this industry and change? Currently, our competitors use different methods, primary one being just covering the animal with a blanket, trying to restrain it. Also, they also use Velcro straps to hold animals down, which hold their bodies but leave their appendages exposed. This can result in scratching, biting, and it can harm anybody nearby. What makes us different is we have a restraining system to where you don't need to be near the animal. The animal could just be rested down and it is restrained by itself. It's limited in motion in all directions and there needs to be no way around. We are offering not only restraint but also a mouthpiece to prevent biting and the anesthesia tube that can be in the animal at the time. We also have the lowest price out of our competitors. So up here on the board, we can see the breakdown of our cost. So the first column represents the part, each part that we're using for the final design. And then at the very last column, we have the total for each part that we're using on the final design. So the total cost to build comes down to $340. And our price that we would sell it for is $550. Our target market currently focuses on companion animal hospitals in the United States, which is roughly 26,500 animal hospitals. Currently, our vet rest product would sell for $550, and the average veterinarian hospital requires at least three recovery beds. So this would yield a potential market opportunity of $44 million. This product has the capability to revolutionize the veterinarian industry and provide a safe, comfortable, customizable, and cheap way of keeping animals and their veterinarians safe in, during re the recovery process. Thank you so much for hearing our presentation. We would like to open up the field to any questions. Thank you very much. The WGF have five minutes for questions. Hi, good job, everyone. Um, my question, you, one of you had said earlier that it's, uh, this device could restrain the patient all the way around. And what I can see from your prototype and your photo was kind of a, a lateral restraint. Right. Maybe, it, how, can you explain how it would keep the patient from going forward or backward? So currently, we cut holes through the mesh material with the super cheap material cost about three dollars for each one and uh, we just cut holes through it slide the animals legs in those holes so they're unable to move forward or backward and obviously this form restrains them from any other directions. Additionally our design doesn't reflect what we would do in, in real life because we were limited by the PVC pipe lengths and the, the rail lengths so in real life the animal would be laying horizontally this way. <clears throat> Excuse me, can you explain how you get the animal out then? Sure. You would unslide the, the bars along the rails and then remove it, its legs. So by, by that time they're awake and fighting, so is it, is it going to be easy to 
get their legs out of the straining fabric? Sure. Well, in this time, we usually they wait until it's rather calm. So. Sure, it act, uh, acts basically like a muzzle in terms of how it wraps around the head. So there are two kind of drawstrings uh, that wrap around and hook to the ends of the mouthpiece. And again, it's a universal fit, so it's rather large, but the teeth fit comfortably on the grooves of the mouthpiece. And it also goes behind the molars, so they have no way of actually pushing both their jaws down. Okay, judges, thank you very much. Well. The next team is Sea Biscuit. All right, and for the final presentation today, Sea Biscuit. Howdy. 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 We are very excited to show everyone here what we've been working on all weekend. My name is Grand Olette, and I'm a junior biomedical engineering major. My name is Peter Winsauer, and I'm a junior biomedical engineer. I'm Adam Johnston. I'm a junior aerospace engineering major. I'm Diego Sol. I'm also a junior aerospace engineering major. I'm Lauren Grace. I'm a sophomore animal science major. I'm Caitlin Mathis. I'm a senior biomedical engineering major. My name is Ashley Sadler and I'm a junior biomedical science major and we are Team Sea Biscuit. We've created a new innovative way that will revolutionize the equine industry. Today we're going to tell you a little bit about the problem we're trying to solve, the research that went behind making our product, how our product actually works, and how it's marketable in the real world. But first we'd like you to watch this video. Have you ever had a sick family member? You'd want them to have the safest treatment out there. Many people would consider their horses to be a part of the family. These cherished family members are lost every year to colic. This can be emotionally devastating to horse owners everywhere. Colic is the leading cause of death in horses, accounting for more than 30% of deaths in 2015. The current treatment involves inserting a tube through the nose into the stomach to administer medication. However, this method poses a major risk. If the tube is inserted incorrectly, the medication could be deposited into the lungs and drown the horse. This procedure is typically done by a seasoned veterinarian. However, no amount of experience can eliminate the risk of death, but a better device can. Nasotube is a new innovative way to ensure the tube is fully inserted into the stomach rather than the lungs. It uses a balloon mechanism to ensure the tube is traveling down the esophagus and towards the stomach. Once arrived, it uses a battery to light a LED indicator to tell the veterinarian it is fully submerged in the stomach. The stomach acid will complete the circuit and illuminate the LED indicator. This guarantees the tube is not placed in the lungs. Keep your horse safe with Nasotube. The problem that we are solving is the need for a device that safely administers medication directly into a horse's stomach. Before we talk about our solution, I would like to talk about the problem of colic in horses. Colic is also defined as abdominal pain. This can be a kink in the intestines or indigestion. It is the number one cause of death for horses in the United States due to a 2015 uh, review. It is 
a diagnostic tool and it can be a helpful treatment tool as well. It is placed through the nose and into the stomach. However, this can be a very dangerous process because the esophagus and the trachea are so close together. This means that instead of going through the esophagus, the tube can easily go through the trachea, into the lungs, medicate the lungs, and drown the patient. Some current techniques right now for veterinarians are all based on feel. The feel of the tube in the esophagus through the neck. The feel of the resistance of the tube. And if placed incorrectly, the feel of airflow from the end of the tube. I believe that our team has created a helpful way that is safer and more accurate to differentiate between the stomach and the lungs. So this process can be a very uncomfortable operation for the horse. I mean, imagine if you're getting a straw stuck up your nose, not the best feeling in the world. So we want to ensure that this is done in the best possible way. So to ensure this, the first requirement that we have placed for ourselves is that we want to limit the diameter of this tube to half an inch. The next thing that we want is to minimize the friction because as it enters the nose, that's the least comfortable position for the horse to be in. Once it gets past that, it's, in, uh, it's, it's a lot easier from there. Next, we want an accurate method of detecting when the tube has been placed in the stomach. The vet needs to know that the, that the tube has been safely placed in the stomach before they can administer the medication to make sure that it's not in the lungs by accident. Next, we want to make sure that the tube is made out of a properly rigid material. It has to be flexible enough to move through the esophagus and inside the horse, but also rigid enough so that it doesn't kink and fold up inside causing complications. Lastly, we want our product to be cost effective and affordable to a variety of different clients. So we estimate that the production costs start at $20 and sales at 60. So we had three preliminary designs. The first one uh, had to do with measuring the acidity in the stomach because some, we all know that stomach acid is much more acidic than any other food in the body. But this proved to be challenging to measure and quantify and we ended up scrapping this idea. The next idea that we had was using a balloon this takes advantage of the fact that most vets use, uh, or they look uh, for the tube inside the esophagus from outside of the horse. There's a small protrusion, and using the balloon would make that much more prominent so they could be sure that the tube has been placed in the esophagus and not throat. Lastly, our final method, our final design is to use an incomplete circuit. It has an LED right in front of the vet. Once the tube has been placed into the stomach, it lights up connecting the circuit and they know that they've made it to the stomach. And our final design is a combination of this balloon and circuit design so that they get the best of both worlds. Our product, the NasoTube, is going to revolutionize the industry. It's reusable which makes it a cost-effective option. Our simple design will be very familiar to any experienced vet who has done this procedure before. So you may ask yourself, why would you make the switch to Naso2? Our product is more accurate and has more safeguards than any other product available today. We accomplish this by using a medical balloon to give visual feedback to the vet so that they know that they have proper placement of the tube in the esophagus. Furthermore, when the tube gets to the stomach, our proprietary LED indication system will light up, ensuring the vet that it has gotten to the stomach and it's now safe to administer the medication. And here to help us with this demonstration is our friend Sea Biscuit. All right. So as you can see here, our nasal tube has already been accurately placed into the esophagus using our visual feedback system. And furthermore, when it, it comes in contact with stomach acid, our innovative LED system lights up and lets the vet know that it's now time to administer the medication. Now this not only adds an extra layer of confidence to an experienced veterinarian, but it also gives them comfort in allowing some of their less experienced staff to do the same procedure themselves. And as you'll see later, this is just the beginning. We designed the naso tube so that way it gives our consumers the most bang for their buck. How do we do that? First of all, it's reusable. It can be sterilized after each and every use. 
So that way it's ready to go for the next patient. Second, it reduces the risk of injuring the animal, thereby avoiding any potential expensive surgeries or lawsuits. Most importantly, the price range. It's $60. We believe that this is more than reasonable for the safety features that the naso tube offers. And we believe that you cannot put a price point on a patient's life. Finally, we believe that the potential for the naso tube is limitless. Currently, the equine industry is a $120 billion industry. And why stop at horses? We want to introduce our product to veterinarians in practice mainly general practice, which are large animal vets in general, all the way up to equine specialists. We also want to introduce our product as a teaching instrument to veterinary schools and tech schools in training these students how to use it. The nasotube is a great choice because it allows users of varying experiences to safely tube a horse. A healthy horse is a happy horse. Choose Naso Two. Thanks and giggle. All right, judges, you have five minutes for questions. So the balloon is inserted, the purpose of the balloon is because technicians already use the location of the, of the tube in the esophagus to see where there's a protrusion in the horse's neck. So to a seasoned veterinarian, this is, this is a pretty obvious, uh, it's pretty obvious to tell, but we want to implement this in veterinary schools as well, where there's less, you know, a, a wider gap in levels of practice. So a brand new student who's never done this procedure before can see much more clearly and more prominently where that protrusion is, so they can make sure that they're in the esophagus before they keep pushing the tube down. So, yeah. you're, so the, the balloon is at the end of the tube and you blow it up once you're in the esophagus and then you deflate it to continue yes. passing. You, okay. you, the Thank only you. Pur the, uh, the purpose of the balloon is just to sell from the outside that you're in the esophagus. Once you can tell, you deflate it causes mild discomfort for the horse, but that's a lot better than the alternative of pulling it through medicating the lungs. Great job. Um, great job, great solution. The question I would have is, um, I would assume then that the end of the tube has to go all the way into the stomach fluids to work. If, it, if it's just in the stomach but not down in the liquid, it wouldn't light up, right? So you have to get there, okay, yeah. Correct. Just, Okay. That, that was an intentional design choice. Yeah, great. To, we would rather have zero percent false positive than give a false positive. So. But I'm, I'm excited about this also because this is one of the reasons I went to small animal medicine is I was scared of killing a horse um, with this. It, it made me turn away. And um, one question I have, just looking at the device I, 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 with the prototype, how durable is this in the field? What I've seen with the tube being thrown around in the back of a truck, tell me more. So this has the same amount of durability as a conventional uh, nas uh, nasogastral tube. Uh, the only addition that we're really implementing here is the fact that there is an electrical component which can be easily removed and it is also safe to wash as well. And the implementation of the balloon at the very end, which is flush with the actual uh, tubing. So there's no real need to worry about having it brush up against something or friction causing it to deflate or pop. None of us are electrical engineers and we were able to implement it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, judges, thank you very much for your questions. You missed it. Thank you very much. Oh my goodness, judges. You now have an incredible difficulty in choosing the top winners. What we're going to do is we're going to take a break here in just a few minutes and give the judges an opportunity for to uh, identify the winners. I want to remind everyone that, again, we're responsible for engineering entrepreneurship. And we're responsible to help you take your ideas into industry and into business. If you're interested in being able to take any of your ideas and to move it forward, please engage with us. We have an incubator here on campus. 
and we have an opportunity to help you continue to develop your product, continue to develop your business, and launch a startup. As I told you before, what I'd love for you to do is I want one of you as a student uh, to graduate, to make enough money to come back and name a building after yourself, all right? So that's what I'm looking for. So uh, we are looking forward to working with you. We'll be back in just a few minutes. I also would like to ask that as you are getting ready, we're going to have a group shot, and we're going to take a group shot on the stairs over by the Starbucks. So we'll have everybody go over there while the judges and I are talking. And all of your prototypes, I'm going to request that all of your prototypes go on the table over there. We'll keep your prototypes for you. That way, you have an opportunity. If you want to continue with them, you'll know exactly where your prototypes are, and we'll have that opportunity to be able to provide that with you. Again, we're going to take a short break. We'll be back with you in a minute. Those of you online, we'll see you soon.
Welcome back uh, to the Aggies event with veterinary medicine. The judges have had an unbelievably difficult time trying to make a decision as to the winners of this particular vet medicine. Um, in fact, they've twist arm, they've, they've twisted my arm into turning into and turning a, an honorable mention as well. So we're going to give an honorable mention of $250 to the team. Now, so that you students who you understand this, uh, this will show up in your student account as scholarship money. So that's the way you'll do it. And we're going to, uh, for the first, second, and third place, we're going to give you these great big blue checks that you can take pictures with. Uh, they're not cashable. Okay? <laughs> and, and I would like them back. All right? So we like to reuse and recycle and so that we use these all the time. So take your pictures, uh, show them off to your friends and things like that. But then we're going to get things going. Again, I really want to emphasize some of these were outstanding ideas and you've put in some great time and effort into them. I do want to spend one quick second and just thank our staff between Hannah and Andres and Aaron is not here. Thank you all so much for our being here. And all, all the mentors and everybody who spent some time putting everything together and the EDC staff, while they're not here, the EDC staff was just outstanding throughout the entire weekend. And y'all were outstanding. The students here, we have commented in that we think this is probably one of the best group of students that we've had. And this is the 36th time we've done Aggies Invent here at Texas A&M University. I want to remind you, Invent for the Planet is coming up in February. Invent for the Planet will have over 35 universities around the world tackling 18, uh, 15 different problems. It'll start in Sydney, Australia, and we're going to have a need statement on the bushfires in Sydney, Australia. We're working with Antarctica to see if we can have a need statement from Antarctica and continue on. So as universities, we're going to see as they come on, you'll be able to work with students across the globe. We should have over a thousand students engaged. So applications are open. If you enjoyed this, please join us again on February 14th to the 16th. All right, without further ado, the honorable mention that uh, the judges twisted my arm into, but they were right, I have to admit, the honorable mention at 250 goes to Padguard. Padguard, if y'all will come on up here. We're going to take a quick picture. I don't have a check for y'all right now, but we're going to take a quick picture, and, and you'll be uh, identified in, uh, in our, in our um, write-up. <laughs> We're going to be happy. That's right. Shall we do Giggum? Yes, please. Okay, here we go. One, two, three. You got it great. Thanks. Thank you very much. Congratulations. 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 All right. And our third place team is Under Pressure. And we have a check for you under pressure. Again, not cashable. All right, in the second place team, and, and Dr. Green is going to provide the check to the second place team, and, and again, Dr. Green has been a tremendous supporter of everything that we do, and so we very much appreciate and working with her throughout this. The second place team is How's My Cow? Yeah, you take uh, pictures and things like that. 
Again, it has been my extreme pleasure to be your guide and your host throughout this entire weekend. I have enjoyed working with each one of you. I hope you will engage with us again. I hope you're able to engage with us in engineering entrepreneurship. We look very forward to working with you. Also, please consider coming back to another Aggies event and continue to develop your skills. Without further ado, the first place team is Seabiscuit. <laughs> This wraps up Aggie's event for Vet Med. We appreciate it. We'll see you later. Y'all remember school starts tomorrow. <laughs>